Histamines are a big issue with children with autism. They're, they, the histamine reaction is something that our body creates as it sees something as an allergic response. But there are certain foods that create a lot of these histamine reactions, and they're histamine-related foods. I'm talk is about histamine intolerance out of uh, uh, my own personal experience. Uh, so why should we care? Uh, these are the kinds of foods which are high in histamines and other biogenic amines. A lot of um, faves among the low-carb crowd, uh, fermented meats, uh, cheeses, um, and there's a big fermentation fad going on right now. Lots of people believe that um, fermented foods are healthy for their gut because they're teeming with bacteria, um, and uh, they're also teeming with biogenic amines, as is aged beef, which is also very popular right now, which has been sort of pre-digested or fermented by uh, bacterial organisms. And uh, the main reason I think that we as physicians uh, need to be aware of histamine and other amine intolerance is because often you'll encounter patients who switched to one of these diets, um, a paleo diet, a ketogenic diet, um, a GAPS diet, low-carb diets, and uh, they either don't feel better when they change to these diets, or in some cases they may feel worse. And this is exactly what happened to me. I've been eating a low carbohydrate, uh, uh, mostly meat diet for a number of years and was feeling a lot better on that from a variety of food sensitivities I developed in my early 40s. And then uh, I, I heard um, Dr. Rosedale and Dr. Seyfried talk at the uh, Ancestral Health Symposium in 2012 where I was giving a talk about vegetables, uh, con, not pro. And, uh, and uh, you know, I became very intrigued by the ketogenic diet, and I thought I would try it myself and write about it on my website for people to take advantage of my unusual experience. So um, I, when I went on this diet, I started having a lot of my old sensitivity symptoms back, some migraines and fatigue, uh, stomach pain, uh, ankle edema, just intermittently. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then uh, a reader wrote in who happened to be a local colleague psychiatrist who said, you know, I wonder if you have a uh, histamine intolerance. So they do not accumulate in our bodies under normal circumstances because they can really wreak havoc on your system. Um, so they live fast, they die young. Uh, in healthy people, they're immediately degraded um, by uh, various enzymes. In the case of tyramine, it's MAO. In the case of histamine, it's diamine oxidase. And, uh, and this, uh, this is an intracellular enzyme which can be toxified both. And uh, so in a healthy person, we have plenty of these enzymes uh, to, to help us uh, uh, for these, so that they won't accumulate in our systems. This, um, this was the bane of my existence in medical school, trying to remember what histamine did depending on which receptor it was attached to. So um, again, histidine is the amino acid, and histamine is the um, biogenic amine, the signaling molecule. Uh, and it's histidine decarboxylase that is the enzyme that, um, that uh, carries out this reaction. There are four different histamine receptors scattered throughout the body, H1, H4, and uh, depending on which receptor uh, it attaches to, it can have a wide variety of effects. So in the brain, it's primarily responsible for sleep-wake regulation. Um, and it's, you know, as far as I can tell from the literature, histamine is not supposed to cross the blood-brain barrier. normal response to food in a healthy person is that we are, we are constantly secreting DAO, uh, the enzyme that breaks down uh, histamine, into our guts. It's just constantly being released. And uh, that's our first line of defense. So if you eat something that has histamine, a nice piece of ripe cheese, um, this is your first line of defense. The DAO will come on attached to the histamine and, and break it down. If it makes it through that first line of defense, there's this intracellular enzyme uh, uh, histamine and methyltransferase, which will degrade the rest of it, or almost the, all of the rest of it. So most people can tolerate a decent amount of histamines in their diet for, the, for these reasons. Um, about 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram dose in the average healthy person. And these are the sources, uh, the exogenous sources of histamine, if you will, from the outside. Um, high histamine foods, things like cheese and uh, red wine and salami and things like that, um, very, and I'll show you a, more, uh, a longer list later. Uh, high histamine foods, high histidine foods, these are foods that naturally contain histidine uh, when they're fresh, but if you leave them out too long or if you are eating leftovers five or six days later, 
uh, bacteria in the environment can st start to degrade these foods which are normally not uh, high in histamine and over time they will accumulate histamine. Um, and then there are trigger foods which may or may not have much histamine or histidine in them, but they, uh, they directly trigger uh, mast cells to release histamine for whatever reason. So uh, this is a list of examples of high histamine foods. For me, this was really quite an eye-opener because I have those migraines and for me the paleo diet did not work out because of that. And carnivore works way better for me, but there are still issues. And um, now I know why. Ladies, let's talk about your cycle. Specifically, let's talk about headaches, diarrhea, and anything that feels like it could be allergies that correlates with your menstrual cycle. Talk about how the menstrual cycle can correlate with histamine intolerance. I recently had a client ask me, I've been suffering from migraines. Is there anything nutritional that you would suggest for migraines? And I said, well, are there any food triggers of your migraines? And she said, no. And I said, well, do they correspond to your menstrual cycle at all? And she said, actually, they usually occur on day 13 of my menstrual cycle, and sometimes they also occur a few days before menstruation starts. Lo and behold, these are the two peaks of estrogen in the menstrual cycle. The first peak is the highest peak. It's also when the estrogen to progesterone ratio is the highest, and it occurs towards the end of ovulation. And then a few days before you start menstruating, you get another second peak of estrogen. It's not as high as the first peak, but it's, it is a second peak, and it's the estrogen to progesterone ratio is not as high because that's when your progesterone is also peaking. So... The first thing I think is, well, how does estrogen relate to diamine oxidase, which is the enzyme that helps you clear histamine, knowing that migraines are one of the symptoms of histamine intolerance. And as it turns out, estrogen profoundly decreases your diamine oxidase activity to the point where high estrogen levels would be expected to cause you to become temporarily histamine intolerant. It's a really good question, yeah. Um, so, uh, so histamine intolerance can mimic a lot of uh, common uh, uh, female complaints, menstrual cramps, migraines, hot, even hot flashes and perimenopause. Um, can be a, because one of the jobs of histamine, uh, for example, is to contract uterine muscles so it can worsen premenstrual cramps. And, uh, you know, it's kind of important to think that histamine intolerance can vary depending on where a woman is in her cycle because estrogen levels are fluctuating. Sometimes I wonder if we should call this herstamine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I've discussed in previous episodes, the symptoms of histamine intolerance are could include migraines, but not only migraines, but also other types of headaches. Diarrhea and things that look a lot like allergies, nasal congestion, asthma-like symptoms, wheezing, low blood pressure, heart palpitations when your heart is feels like it's skipping or fluttering or beating irregularly, hives, itching, and flushing. If these things correlate with your menstrual cycle and with the estrogen peaks, it could well be because you have become temporarily histamine intolerant. Now, what would you do in a situation like that? Well, what I would suggest is getting a diamine oxidase supplement. In the previous episode, which I'll link to in the description, I recommended Seeking Health Histamine Block or Ancestral Kidney Extract. This is the company he is talking about. And I've been ordering those supplements for a while now. They are really good quality. I can recommend them as well. And this is the Q 
kidney supplement. Or two of the kidney extract capsules at the same uh, same time, so 15 minutes before you eat foods that have histamine in them. What I would do is I would get these supplements and keep them to only use during the parts of your menstrual cycle where you expect these symptoms to occur, and then I would dose them preventatively. So if you expect the headaches to be to come day 13, give or take one day, start taking these supplements with your foods on day 12, take it on day 13, take it on day 14, just to cover that window and see if that reduces or eliminates the symptoms. Ideally, taking this would prevent the development of those symptoms. If it does work, then you have a solution that you can uh, essentially carry around with you. And the fact that you're only taking it a few days per month makes it much more affordable to use those supplements. That's a much better position than having the not seeing the pattern and not knowing when the symptoms are going to come and having to take something like that all the time. So this is the Dow supplement. I'm sure there are others as well. I decided to try it out and see what happens if it helps with those migraines because otherwise on carnivore I really feel the best I ever have. It's only that time during the months. Obviously the estrogen peak when I don't feel so well. Apart from that Carnivory has really, really helped and all the symptoms I had are gone, except the migraines. And you see here fructose malabsorption and this is another reason why I really stopped doing the paleo approach. Again those are the symptoms you can have. For me, this is also true, the anxiety, nervousness before menstruation. And this one too. Unfortunately, in the NEMCHEC protocol, inulin is used. So again, that's why I am not suited for that protocol. And I just stick to carnivory and try this Dow supplement approach. What always helped me tremendously Whenever I felt bloated or couldn't digest something gassy, whatever, even constipation or diarrhea, both, um, I take activated charcoal and it really helps every single time. Once I had food poisoning, and I really felt like dying. It's horrible. From a carrot salad that was organic. And the date was still okay. But I still got food poisoning. Horrible, horrible diarrhea. Horrible vomiting for days and it didn't stop. I didn't feel better. So somebody suggested to me to take activated charcoal. So since then I always have activated charcoal 
with me wherever I go. That's the one I use. You get it in every pharmacy. Escomboy poisoning is, is basically just uh, uh, what we'll talk about in a minute, and then histamine intolerance, where people can respond to react to smaller amounts of histamine. So scomboid poisoning is basically uh, food poisoning that occurs if you eat mishandled fish or fish that's been sitting around too long. Uh, and uh, the amount of histamine in the fish can exceed 500 milligrams per kilogram. And remember that the average uh, healthy person can tolerate maybe 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram at a time. Uh, and to make things even more complicated, uh, most biogenic amines don't exist in isolation. So, uh, you know, bacteria, a variety of different types of bacteria may contain a number of different enzymes which break down a number of different amino acids into a number of different biogenic amines. So we rarely, if ever, see histamine in isolation in a food. It's almost always sitting there with lots of other biogenic amines, most importantly, putrescine and cadaverine. So the same thing can happen with salad. For me, it was carrot salad organic, as I said before. Yeah, here it's tomatoes. And the reaction was actually immediately. I ate it and then diarrhea, like immediately. And later on came the vomiting for three days until I took the activated charcoal. As I was researching, everything I could find about histamines and I remember that uh, zeolite actually used to be something um, I would detox my body during my fruitarian days and I remember that I didn't have migraines during that time even though the fructose did its own damage after some time, but during my fruitarian days I had very few migraines. And I remembered I was using a lot of zeolite and activated charcoal because I was into the detox fat, but now I learned that it also helps with histamines. So, so there is another thing that I found out yesterday. Um, I always had an issue with summer heat. I really don't like summer. It makes me more irritated, angry, moody. My anxiety levels are higher, so in a nutshell, I hate summer for that reason. Now, it appears that this has to do with raised histamine levels. Again, histamine. I used to have an uh, allergy from only summer sun. It would result in an itchy rash on my index finger and thumb. And it was kind of painful. Like it would look like um, burnt from nettles, if you know how that looks like. This is how it would look like. But it was actually from sun exposure during summer. So of course I started to avoid summer sun. Because it was not only itchy but also painful. 
Yeah, and apparently this is a histamine issue as well. Then somebody suggested the NEMCHEC protocol that many autistics have used and had quite a lot of success. So this is how they look at autism. But from what I read in the book, they definitely acknowledge the genetic component. It's definitely an uh, interesting read. This book looks at autism from a completely different angle. And I'm always very happy to learn new things or a new perspective. It helps you to connect the dots. Yeah, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You look at all the pieces and that's how you get the whole picture. Literally. So this is the fish oil she recommends that contains rosemary. So always, always check the ingredients first before you just trust a so-called expert. Always check the ingredients for yourself. Do your research. To quickly report about the awakening that we are experiencing during the Nemechek protocol. The Nemechek protocol is a protocol from a doctor in near Phoenix, Arizona, Patrick Nemechek, and he um, developed this protocol of anulin, which is a prebiotic fiber, and it's a sweet powder, and omega-3 fatty acids in pretty high dose, and extra virgin olive oil that is pure real olive oil simple um, reducing omega-6 oils and those are things like soy oil safflower sunflower um, peanut oil any vegetable oils like that the good oils are things like coconut oil um, canola oil, he says, is okay. I don't like it, so we don't use really? that. Canola and oil. butter, ghee, me? lard from pastured animals only. And um, palm oil is okay, as well as what else? Um, Why would you need so many plant oils? I think that's it. No, of course, olive oil, but I said that already. Okay, so what we've done is we've reduced all the omega-6s. A lot of those are in packaged stuff, and yeah, it's been about six thing. weeks now. Always a good thing. And on Tuesday, today is Sunday, so it'll be six weeks and two days. Um, and what we've experienced with my son so far, he's 10, 
and he is on a quarter teaspoon of inulin powder and a about 1600 milligrams of omega-3s, which is EPA and DHA combined. And he is on two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil that is, we're sure is pure olive oil, California Olive Farms, I think it's called brand. And he's on that. And he started at a little bit lower, lower dosage than that. And what we found is interesting. He, his behavior has regressed slightly. So he, emotionally, he's acting a little bit less mature, but he is more compliant. He's more willing to do what I've asked of him. And the reason I'm coming on tonight is because today he noticed when our dog is having, he's an old boy, 15 years old, and he's having vestibular issues. And last week he was dizzy and fell over and we took him to the emergency vet. This time it happened while he, while my son was with his babysitter, I was upstairs and he called for me. He said, come down, come down. Milo's having an, an episode. And I came down and I helped him. And then he asked me, is there anything I can do to help him? And these things, if you know autism, are huge. Um, verbalizing offers to help and even noticing that he was having a problem and then asking me for help, huge. And I'm just like in awe, like it goes back and forth because I think to myself, what in the world? He's like doing crazy things. Like yesterday he put paint on Nerf darts and then he decided to shoot them at the wall. And these are things he's never done before. He's always very cautious, very careful. And, um, but actually that's a good sign of his brain waking up and developing like how he would have done when he was maybe, I don't know what age a kid would typically do that. Um, and think it was okay, maybe five. Um, so that part of his brain is waking up. He accidentally killed his little pet lizard the other week, a couple of weeks ago. Um, which are all little mistakes that I would expect a younger kid to make. He's almost 11. Um, he's wearing deodorant now, you know, mm, but he's really? emotionally making these mistakes that he wouldn't have made before. So it's kind of hard to witness, but at the same time, I realized that it's his brain healing. Okay. So now she's sure that this are signs that the brain is healing. Okay. I don't know. This was from 2017. I'm not sure how this has developed. But just saying some autistics can't deal with any plant fiber or in this case inulin. But some seem to do very well on this protocol. So yeah why not try it for those who have no reactions to the protocol why not I'm definitely i highly recommend the book written by nina teichelt she has done a lot of research on vegetable oils and written about it in her book the big fat surprise it's an excellent book and once you have read that you don't want to consume any vegetable oils anymore. It's disgusting. And they said avoid saturated fats, you were supposed to replace them with vegetable oils, right? That was the idea going back to the 1960s. Hi, I'm Kaya Perot, one of the producers of the Doctor's Pharmacy podcast. We have unfortunately been taught to think that fats and oils are damaging for our health and lead to things like cardiovascular disease, but this is not necessarily true. When it comes to fats, the type of fat we eat matters. As a society, we've been conditioned to believe that unsaturated fats from vegetable and seed oils are best and that butter, lard, ghee, and other saturated fats are toxic. In fact, the reverse is true. Dr. Hyman discussed some of the history behind this misunderstanding with leading science journalist Nina Teichels. Well, this is where the food industry does come in a little bit, just to start off this story. So the um, 
the the vegetable oil industry was kind of born in the early 1900s, right? The first vegetable oil product was Crisco. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> so it used to be that those oils were used for the Industrial Revolution. Um, they were used to, to lubricate machinery. And then they figured out how to harden them to make them, and they <laughs> learned how to bleach them and make them look white. And then they thought, and it was actually Procter & Gamble that, that figured out how to do that. They were going to make it into a soap. You know, soap is made from oil. Instead, they're like, yeah. mm, that looks an awful lot like lard. Hard. Let's try yes. to sell it as a food. Yeah. So they started to sell it as a food. Um, and fat. Yeah. So it turns out that they contained, you know, that it's what they, the hardening vegetable oils is done through a process called hydrogenation and that produces trans fats. But so these, these trans fatty hardened oils were started to be sold to Americans in 1911. Um, so coincidentally, um, heart disease starts to take off, right? Uh, right around maybe like ten years later, um, we start seeing increases in death from heart disease. So, um, so then Procter and Gamble figures out how to just sell oil as oil. So one of the things to understand about um, these oils is they're pressed. Well, Procter and Gamble produced like shampoo. <laughs> yeah, well, they they were a soap maker, so Amazing. that's why they came up with this. So, but they were like, but Crisco was like a best selling thing. Mm -hmm. They convinced, you know, in America. So all these immigrants, so uh, and they want to become American, right? And so Procter and Gamble had this brilliant advertising campaign, basically saying, you know, give up lard. Those are the far, the bygone days of your grandmothers, like the spinning wheel of the olden days, and you know, have Crisco instead. And this is yeah. the newfangled thing made uh, in you know shiny scientist kitchens. So um, so uh, Procter and Gamble figured out how to then make vegetable oils that were fluid in bottles. They kind of tinkered with the fatty acids to make them stable. Um, and then, uh, so here's the where they, they start to influence nutrition science. In 1948, um, the American Heart Association, which is really just an association of cardiologists, right? Remember, heart disease is new. Tiny little association. Yeah. They barely had an office. They were just yeah. like, they barely had any funds. Procter and Gamble comes in and says, "We're going to make you the designee of this radio show uh, for the, a week." And over, it was this huge deal. Overnight, literally, according to the official history of the American Heart Association, they said millions of dollars flowed into our coffers. We became overnight the powerhouse, opening offices all across the country that we are today. They're still the number one largest non for profit in the in the country. Amazing. All thanks to Procter and Gamble. And pretty soon thereafter they started to recommend that you start eating vegetable oils to prevent a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Which um, was the worst idea because it turns out that trans fats, everybody agrees in this, have killed hundreds of thousands, millions of people over the decades. Trans oh, so that's yeah, the trans fats and the hardened vegetable oils in Crisco are bad for health, clearly bad for health, but in the liquid form And now they're ruled as not safe to eat by the FDA after right. fifty years of pressure to change right. that. Right. Uh, and finally took a lawsuit from a ninety seven year old scientist who first discovered this fifty years ago to get them to change. So uh, vegetable oils, um, so it turns out that it they when they're in the oil form, they're also dangerous. So they don't contain trans fats, right? But in the oil form, the oils are highly unstable. That means mm. that they oxidize easily. Go rancid. They go rancid. Oxidation is, remember, that's why we take antioxidants, because oxidation causes inflammation in Wrinkles. your body. Yeah, like, yes, that's actually true. On the inside and the outside. <laughs> heart, causes heart disease on the inside. Oxidized LDL is what's thought to, to provoke that unstable plaque that causes heart blockages like in the heart. cholesterol. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. So this is what, and in those clinical, in that, on all those studies, remember we talked about the Minnesota Coronary Survey where they had people, some people on, on vegetable oil diets. In all of those studies, again and again and again, the people on the vegetable oil diets died at much higher rates from cancer. Mm. This was considered a side effect of this uh, heart healthy diet. And they actually had a series of very high level meetings at the NIH in the early 1980s to figure out what was going on with this side effect of cancer. And nobody could figure it out. And they basically just said, look, we believe that vegetable oils will help people prevent heart disease. So we're going to ignore the cancer effect. Removing all those stupid plant oils is always a good thing. Hi guys, it's Sarah Nissen from sarahnissen.com. I just realized that it's been over a year since we started the Nemechek protocol for my son and for myself. 
um, it was actually September 5th that we started and I did a blog post about six weeks in in the middle of October last year and I haven't done one since so here we are um, people have been asking me for an update and now I realize why because it's been a whole year um, it's funny because when I look back at the year you know it's hard for humans to see progress so I focus on the negative and I don't see the progress so it's really a good idea I would suggest to you guys who are doing the protocol to actually do a monthly at least video of your kids and yourself if you're on the protocol to keep track because it's so easy to forget you know forget the progress for me especially I have such a hard time I'm like, oh no, nothing's different. But in reality, I looked, I went back and watched my other video just now and how he had just had the awakening and he was acting much more immature. And I'm so happy to report that um, we've been going through a lot of stress. It's been probably the most stressful year of my life this past year. And of course, my son's life. Um, so some of the biggest things that I, I can recall from the last year is continuing to notice things, um, being much more aware of what's going on around him and being much more flexible in general. Um, he's been in speech therapy, counseling therapy since January and um, OT as well, and he does karate. And his karate has just been getting better and better. His memory is phenomenal for things he's interested in. Um, he is highly gifted, but with the disability of the autism, it's hard for that to show through sometimes because his working memory was so poor, his handwriting is pretty poor. He has what I would consider dysgraphia, although he doesn't have a diagnosis of that and I looked into it the book is very interesting and makes a lot of sense however my body doesn't like olive oil and apparently again it has to do with histamine so if you have a Tao deficiency, it is a problem with the olive oil. And the Nemchek protocol is about taking olive oil, fish oil, and inulin. Unfortunately, in the Nemchek protocol, inulin is used. So, again, that's why I am not suited for that protocol. And I just stick to carnivory and try this Tao supplement approach. So, vast majority are female. I think this is because of the estrogen. So for me, this is definitely true as well, because I know I react to casein, whey, and lactose. I react to gluten, and I react to soy and fructose and maltodextrin. 
and uh, Chinese food always gave me migraines. So MSG possibly is also causing reactions. But then there is the histamine issue that needs to be considered in my case. So I think it's important to identify all the triggers that cause problems. On a carnivore diet you are quite safe. So for myself it doesn't seem to be a problem. I can buy ground meat in the store as long as I eat it the next day. It's fine. It's good to be aware of that and not letting it sit too long in the fridge. So if I take something out of the freezer, um, I'll wait until it is just enough so I can cook it and uh, I don't wait too long. But you have to avoid the processed meats or cheeses, things like that. The DAO supplements are available. I'm trying one now myself to see you know, how, how it goes. They're, they're rather expensive, um, uh, but they can be very helpful. The, the trick with them is that you have to take them uh, no longer than 20 minutes uh, before you eat something that you suspect might contain a trigger food because uh, it has to be right there in the gut with the food that you're eating. So and now the practical problem in daily life trying to find f fresh foods or fresh foods that are low in histamine is that histamine is indestructible. Uh, it, you know, the, the, once it has been formed in a food, you cannot get rid of it. There is no method for getting rid of histamine that has uh, been formed in a food. So the best you can do is arrest the bacterial process. Um, so if, as soon as you buy a food, you want to put it in, like, especially meat or fish, you want to put it immediately on ice, and that slows the process way down, the histamine production way down. Um, if you freeze the food, it will destroy the enzyme, but it doesn't destroy the histamine that's already there. Um, if you cook it again, um, it'll destroy the enzyme, but it won't destroy the histamine. And if you cook a food and then you let it sit around for a few days in your refrigerator, more histamine could be produced over time. So, um, Some of the logistical um, helpful things that I've found for myself and for people who write in, check the grocer's packed on date. And it's not always there. Um, but try to buy meat where you actually ask, the, ask the, the butcher, like, when was this packaged? Or look, some, some foods will have a packed on date. And, and look how long they expect the meat to last, I mean, 12 days. So um, it's, it's apparently okay to sell this 12 days later, but not for somebody with histamine intolerance. Somebody with histamine intolerance is going to have to buy it um, as soon as it's packed, or that same day or maybe the next day. Uh, so histamine toxicity, which can occur in anybody, anybody sitting here, uh, if you eat too much histamine for your natural defenses, you will, uh, you will get sick.